Okay, so in this video I'm going to show you how we can find the forces that are acting on a pendulum. Uh, so if we look at our pendulum here, we can resolve our forces, and what we end up with is tension acting along the wire, and mass of, uh, sorry, and weight of the pendulum acting straight down. So that gives us a resultant force, and we can construct a force triangle where theta is the angle between the pendulum and the vertical line. If you look at that, you should see by inspection that mg is equal to t cos theta. Uh, we just crush the angle, that's the rule. Um, if I wanted to then find what fr is, that would be t sine theta. Now what we're going to use is a trig identity here, which is that sine of theta divided by cos of the same theta is always equal to tan theta. So what I can do is if I divide my first equation by my second equation, I get t sine theta over t cos theta will be equal to fr divided by mg. So then that means that I can rewrite this triangle uh, by saying that fr over mg is equal to tan of theta. Uh, you might also recognize that is just a nice simple uh, trig identity as well. Okay, so what can I do with that? Well, let's kick off with keeping this equation, fr over mg is equal to tan theta. Um, what I can also do is think about the actual physical properties that have led to us getting this um, triangle. So I have this length here, it's the length of my pendulum, uh, and here is the angle theta, and x here will be my displacement. So what I can say is that sine of theta, if we remember the trig identity, sine of theta is opposite divided by hypotenuse, uh, then that means that for this triangle, it's x over l. Now what's important to remember here is that the theta over here is equal to the theta over here. Uh, these are similar triangles. While the first triangle from this equation comes from resolving the forces, the triangle from this equation comes from the actual layout of where the pendulum is. But the thetas are the same. So for both the theta here and the theta here, that's the same angle. Now what I'm going to use is a little trick of trigonometry here, which is that sine of an angle is approximately equal to tan of an angle if the angle is small, say below about 5 degrees. Um, so this means that this, well, everything I'm going to do from now on only works for a pendulum with a small displacement. But if that does work, then because tan of theta is equal to sine of theta, that means that I can say fr over mg is equal to x over l. These two uh, expressions are the same. Um, so if I just rearrange my equation, I can then say that the resultant force is equal to xmg divided by l. And if I rearrange it a little bit more, I can say, well, f is equal to ma. So that means that the acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. Substituting that into my equation, I get that the acceleration of my pendulum bob is equal to xmg divided by M L. Uh, obviously you can see that the two m's cancel, and I wind up with an equation acceleration is equal to xg divided by L. Now what I can say about this then is that my acceleration is proportional to x, because my g and my L are going to be constants in this equation. So acceleration only depends on displacement, and if we think back to what we said when we first started doing simple harmonic motion, that's exactly what we want. We want an acceleration that is directly proportional to my displacement, but that acts towards the equilibrium point. Alright, so we're going to start off with A is, root is equal to xg over L. If we think back to a previous lesson, then we found earlier that for simple harmonic motion, the force causing simple harmonic motion is always equal to the mass of the object times its angular frequency squared times its displacement. Remember, that's only for simple harmonic motion. If I rearrange that to get acceleration, just using Newton's law, then I get A is omega squared 
x. Important to remember here that omega squared here is just 2 pi over t. And omega squared will actually be changing uh, the angle of velocity, the, angle of the rate of change of angular displacement will be changing in simple harmonic motion. So we have to use this derivation. Okay, so what I can do is I can make the two things equal to each other. What I find is that the x's cancel straight away, so I get omega squared is equal to g over l. What I'm going to do now is use uh, the fact that omega squared is 2 pi over t, and I'm going to say 2 pi over t squared is equal to g divided by l. I can then rearrange that equation a little bit more, um, take the square roots of both sides, and then I can carry on rearranging to find what time period is equal to. Now this is something really, really profound. What I've found is that for a pendulum, it does not matter what the displacement is. My equation shows that all the time period depends upon here is the length of the pendulum and the strength of gravity. Up here we cancelled out our displacement terms. So only these, fun these terms remain. Um, and this is kind of exactly what we would expect, so it's always good to do a bit of sanity checking at the end of some physics. Do I expect that if L gets bigger, T gets bigger? Yes, I do. Longer pendulums should take longer to complete each swing. If I move to a planet with stronger gravity, well, the pendulum will be pulled harder. So, yeah, I would expect T to get smaller. So this equation is doing exactly what I expect, and I can be fairly certain of it. And actually, I can tell you, yes, this is the correct equation to use. Um, so what you're going to be doing for homework now is planning an experiment to find the force of gravity with a known length of pendulum. So one of the things you're going to be thinking about is what is it that you can plot on your axes in order to get a straight line graph. And I will leave that to you as an exercise.